It's the shout. The shout again for the crew of all in his lifeboat, the Forester's future. As it heads out to sea, who knows what's ahead, even though the launch conditions are good. The outcome of this service, as they modestly call it, rests through the efficiency of man and machine. Man whose single-minded dedication to rescuing those in peril has, over the years, brought many honors for brave deeds, gallantry. A machine with sophisticated technology for navigation and high horsepower under the stern to combat the forces of wind and sea. But it was by no means like this for lifeboatmen in earlier years. The only horsepower available to them at the turn of the century was to help launch those immense wooden steel boats, which was often a hideously heavy task. No one knows for sure which were the first lifeboats in service, but in 1789, a group of Newcastle businessmen calling themselves the Gentlemen of Law House offered a prize for the best design of a rescue boat calculated to negotiate the dangers of the sea. A design submitted by one William Woodhave, using a straight keel with high ends and watertight cases full of cork, to make it self-writing and unsinkable was considered the best. But he was only offered half of the two guinea prize because two members of the adjudicating committee thought that with a few modifications to his design, they could come up with a better vessel for the purpose. They entrusted the making of this new craft to Henry Greathead and it was called the original. Greathead was a local builder and gave the boat a curved keel with high ends, but although he used Woodhave's idea of cork-filled cases for extra buoyancy, it was not self-writing. It could, though, be rowed from both ends, which avoided the dangerous manoeuvre of turning round, which put the boat parallel to the breaking waves and made her vulnerable to capsize. There was no rudder, and that function was served by oars trailing over the stern. Crewmen like Thomas and Matthew Coleman could have told countless stories of rescue attempts that would have put fear into many a seaman's heart of those early days of life-saving with little or no organisation. It was many years later that Sir William Hillary decided to change all that. He'd been a lifeboatman at Douglas in the Isle of Man and wrote and published a pamphlet called an appeal to the British people for forming a national institution for the preservation of lives and property from shipwreck. Thomas Wilson, Member of Parliament for the City of London, read this rather long title document and he pressed for and got a public meeting. It was held in the City of London Tavern and the Archbishop of Canterbury took the chair. Those present passed a resolution calling for the creation of an organisation to be called the National Institution for Preservation of Life from Shipwreck. That was passed on the 24th of March, 1824. It became popularly but unhappily known as the Shipwreck Institution. And so, in 1854, its name was changed to the Royal National Lifeboat Institution commonly abbreviated to the RNLI. From then on, boats came in all shapes and sizes. Those early ones relied entirely on oars and sails. They gave little protection to the crew, but still, by their skill and courage, those early lifeboatmen saved hundreds of lives in their often perilous craft. Soon, lifeboat stations appeared all round the coast of Britain, and there men and women toiled many long hours as volunteers. There was a great sense of pride in the local communities where those stations operated, and there was no shortage of crewmen willing to put to sea in all kinds of conditions.
In 1881, the ship Indian Chief went aground in atrocious weather on Long Sands off the Thames estuary. Lifeboats from Alderborough, Clacton and Harwich to the north of the Thames and Ramsgate to the south set out about midday. Tugs were commonly used in those days to tow lifeboats out to sea, and the tug Vulcan, with the Bradford from Ramsgate straining on the line, took almost five hours to cover the 30 miles to the Indian chief. The seas were so rough when they set out that the coxswain Charles Fish said afterwards that the Vulcan was thrown up like a ball and his starboard paddle came clear of the water high enough for a coach to have passed underneath it. By 5 p.m. that afternoon, darkness was closing in and the Kentish Knock lightship was sighted. There were signals from the lightship, but the Indian chief couldn't be found in the darkness. Tired, cold and wet, the lifeboatmen and the crew of the Vulcan resolved to stay on Long Sand until dawn. For the next 14 hours, they sought what little comfort they could find as the waves swept over their tiny open boat in that howling gale. As the lifeboat pitched and tossed, the ten men huddled together for warmth, while the other two, secured by lifelines, acted as lookouts and prepared for a long, cold night. As dawn broke, one of the crew spotted the wreck and the lifeboat immediately cast off her tow rope and hoisted her sails. The seas around Long Sand were a boiling fury, and they carried away all but the foremast of the Indian chief rigging. The master and 16 of his crew perished during the night, and their bodies were tangled in the wreckage of spars, rigging, and torn canvas. A fearful wreck she looked, with her main and mizzen mast gone and her bulwarks washed away, and great bolts of timber and planking ripped out of her, going overboard with every surge of the sea. With immense difficulty, the lifeboat came in close to the wreck, and as seas swept right over her, the eleven survivors were taken aboard one by one and slowly helped back to the Vulcan. Those savage seas still battered the boat. Eventually, after 26 hours, Vulcan, with the Bradford in tow, laboured back into Ramsgate Harbour, 26 hours after they'd set out. They were met by a stunned crowd who could hardly believe the physical suffering, anguish and fatigue on the survivors' faces. Stirring accounts of the rescue appeared in the Daily Telegraph and were an inspiration to the whole nation. Coxon Fish was awarded the gold medal of the institution with silver for his crew and a crew of the Vulcan. Then, as now, the entire income to support the RNLI came from voluntary donations. But in 1891, Charles Macara, chairman of the Lifeboat Committee, was concerned to find that some two-thirds of its regular income came from only a hundred people, and he resolved to change all that. So, with the help of the press, he launched a major appeal to support the RNLI. Although he was rather an abrasive character, he enlisted the support of many leading figures, including the Lord Mayors of Salford and Manchester, and so organised the first street collection in October 1891. The procession included three bands and two lifeboats, and in an atmosphere of excitement, people threw money down into the collecting carts from upstairs windows on the tops of tramcars. From these origins came the Flag Day, which soon became a regular part of British life. By 1899, the flamboyant Charles Macara, now Sir Charles, had established Lifeboat Saturday with thousands of people taking part, and he brought a new kind of pageantry to the streets of Britain. Indeed, it was said of him that he brought charity to the streets and streets to the charity. By now, steam and motor lifeboats were well on their way, 
and from its tentative beginnings the RNLI was now here and here to stay. The Royal National Lifeboat Institution has come a very long way from the humble original to today's powerful boats. Steve Shaw, coxswain of the orderly lifeboat, explains. This is a breed class lifeboat. She's the smallest of the offshore lifeboats, 33 foot long. She was built in 1984. She has twin Caterpillar 3208 V8 diesels in her, uh, giving a horsepower of 208 for each engine and a boat speed, top boat speed of 21 and a half knots. The boat is designed to self right which she did in her capsized trials in 2.1 seconds. Uh, she carries a crew of four to five and has a fuel range of 120 nautical miles at full speed. As you can see, the boat is very well equipped. There's a DECA 060 radar with video processor for image intensification, a SIMRAD radio direction finder. We have a marine band multi-channel VHF radio, an air band VHF radio and a mobile VHF radio. Down here we have the survivors accommodation. Survivors are taken down there and locked in with a crew member. There is communication to the helm. They can be given first aid, blankets, thermal equipment and hot drinks. Navigator sits down here. As soon as the boat is launched, he relays information to the coxswain of the course and, and the casualties position. This is the uh, rocket line stowage. Rocket lines are kept ready round, uh, rockets in them ready to fire if we need to uh, rig a breeches buoy at all. Spare fuses and rockets are kept. In the next compartment, the most important two items of equipment on the lifeboat, the kettle. and ship's brandy for very severe weather only. I've had a good excuse to use that. The story of the lifeboat service is endless and not just tales of bravery, although there's much of that, but of endurance, tenacity and faith to someone Clinging to a life raft, the knowledge that the lifeboat will keep looking for them perhaps for days is a vital thread of hope. Forrester's future is Alderney's second lifeboat. The first was stationed here over a hundred years ago, but it was never used because no one would volunteer to face the perils of the race and the swinge. But now a team of 14 men stands by to make a five-man crew, ready for any emergency reported to the Alderney lifeboat station, which was re-established in May 1985. Got their hands on, wasn't it? Yep. <coughs> Got the wall. 
The readiness of men and women to put to sea in boats, even at risk of their own lives to save others, is one of the most splendid of human characteristics. Long may it continue. 